why is the world in the mess that it's in right now? Sheldon Solomon is best known for co-developing terror management theory based on the theories of social scientist Ernest Becker concerning how humans deal with their own sense of mortality. He is professor of social psychology at Skidmore College and is the author or co-author of over a hundred articles and several books. 97% of the world's scientists agree that global climate change is due in large part to human activity. We may be the first form of life to be responsible for our own extinction. And yet, large parts of our American population deny this assessment and conclusion. Why? I'm Sheldon Solomon. This is episode four of our conversation series. In this episode, we try to understand the social response to climate change. What is the threat of climate change? Resources are going to become scarce when the temperature is beginning to rise, when water is habitable for jellyfish but not for humans. And we already are seeing those things happen. We're already in a society with hundreds of thousands of climate refugees. We're losing islands literally um, in the Pacific. We have people dying of heat waves, thousands of people dying of heat waves in India. When I think about what we have to change, it's like enormous. What we're looking at is literally the destruction of the human race, and we're already destroying many things. Animals are disappearing all the time. Flora and fauna and also like, you know, literal societies are, are disappearing. So it's enormous and it's really uh, terrifying. There is a movement that is combining this concept of an environmental crisis and a social crisis and that people call climate justice, a climate justice movement. And who's gonna be affected by it ultimately? And who's gonna be affected by it is people who live in poverty, people of color, people of the third world um, or the global south. And I think climate justice is about the justice that the, in, the injustice that's inherent in our system and how those injustices are gonna worsen. How does death denial factor into our understanding of the social response to climate change? From Becker's point of view, um, our discomfort with nature is part and parcel to our disinclination to die, our kind of uh, insatiable desire for money and stuff is just the flip side of that. You see very evidently that climate change is so existential. People are denying it because of how scary it is from um, the point of view of us being very mortal. Be great. Why do we have to be right? Why do we have to have other people like us? And what terror management theory is, does is points to something that lies beneath the surface of that that you can't see, like a worm at the core. Yeah. It's 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 that 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 hidden that hidden source of fear or terror that's driving the things that we can see. To me, that's what's interesting, and also what some people don't get is that we're we're talking about something that in if if, if our theory is right, you can't really directly observe in yourself. Our cavalier disregard for nature is part and parcel of our disinclination to die. I say this based on the studies that we and other folks have done. Uh, you remind people of death and they want more money. You remind people of death and they want more stuff. You remind people of death and they are more willing to make exploitative decisions about natural resources that are non-renewable. And so, you know, the denial of death makes us more ardently embrace all of the things that we surround ourselves with psychologically that literally do enhance our survival, but also symbolically in the long run uh, may end up killing us. I think that's the irony. I think there's like an enormous irony, just like a bitter irony about that, that like we're creating this 
world that is really disposable in the sense that we want to feel eternal. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, made doubly insane by the fact that it won't make us live any longer, but the plastic spoon will be here in perpetuity. <laughs> long after we're gone. Yeah. So we grope for symbolic immortality uh, yeah. while the wrapper on our cheeseburger has right. acquired literal Literally immortality. I think you figured it out. We need to become plastic. <laughs> Maybe so. You know, it gets back to John Locke. Anything of true value is of a finite nature. So aesthetically as well as pragmatically, I'd rather there be a Kmart or a parking lot than uh, any kind of nature itself. And what we're starting to study now is, is how we treat other animals. And what we're finding in our lab is when you remind people of death, they become more negative toward other animals. They become more tolerant of the killing of other animals. And this was very central to Becker's analysis, right. where he argued that at some point in history, as we became more acutely aware of our own mortality, we had to deny our animality and disidentify with other animals and in fact show our domination and right. superiority to other animals. And we're seeing that play, played out in the way uh, we treat other animals. One of the really deep, intractable, and tragic dimensions of environment, and this is probably in some ways the basis of, of Becker's thinking, is that if you start thinking about nature and us as creatures in nature, everyday life becomes almost unbearably conflicted because you're living every day by killing, chewing, digesting, and excreting other living things. So if you think about nature, nature is not a tranquil, ideal farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, in fact, nature is a uh, tsunami of Ebola. You know, yes. yeah, it's Ebola, it's killing, it's starvation, it's population boom and crash. Nature is cancer, as well as, as uh, the, the ideal shepherd uh, with his oaten pipe on the, on the hill. It's also an open question um, among folks who study these things whether um, making people aware of the ultimate correct. danger is useful. Yeah, I mean, is it going to terrify them into action? Does it in fact defuse the threat? You have a point there, not to go all egghead, but there, these uh, researchers, they just did these really scary studies based on our work. Uh, you know how a lot of cigarette makers put like gory pictures of lung cancer? on the packs, this in Canada and other countries, uh -huh. uh, that increases smoking. Well, <laughs> yeah, because it makes mortality salient and people who smoke in order to reduce the death anxiety, they smoke more. In the book, The Worm at the Core, in the last chapter. Sounds like a good one. Uh, it's all right. Uh, you know, Will Murphy, our, our acquisition editor, made us work real hard, and he wanted us to solve everything yeah. in the last chapter. And we kept telling him, there's no simple solution. There's no easy answer. Uh, self-help books are full of crap. Or if they weren't, if there was one self-help book that wasn't full of crap, you wouldn't have 5,000 of them. You'd just have one of them, and everybody would be great. Doesn't, doesn't work that way. It's not that simple. And we can't give answers to anybody. We can just lay out, here's, here's the analysis, here's what the evidence says, here's ways really smart people back from the ancient Greeks to the current time have suggested you might be able to cope better with your fear of death in less destructive, more constructive ways. But the reader's gotta take that and figure it out for themselves. And there's no, simple formula and there's no simple way. We didn't want to write a book like that because we don't think that that works. Hopefully our, our, our approach in our book is it comes from understanding. And so we provide understanding and then a person can step back and maybe be able to get some sense, some element of choice and creativity in their own way of carving out a way to feel meaningful in this life. But there's no easy answers on what that should be or how to accomplish that. 
What are some of the cultural underpinnings? I think the kind of worldview that Pope Francis is responding to is, in quote, an illusion that we have found meaningful um, as a way of gaining our feelings of heroism, our feelings of achieving something of importance and greatness that will outlast us. Um, but they are very much tied up in the material world and uh, the, the production of more and more stuff and getting more of it in more different colors and replacing it with new stuff, that invidious distinction uh, Veblen talks about. He's providing a, a whole new platform for the ways that we describe who we are in relationship to other people, who we are in relationship to animals, what we are in relationship to the physical environment. When everything becomes um, an object in, the, uh, in whatever goal you've set for yourself, everything is to be used to get you to that goal, and that includes the Earth, creatures, and other human beings. It's still just this sort of residual cowboy attitude that we have that we're gonna, you know, we conquered the West and the environment is something to be used as a tool for us to bring ourselves up. It's all variable in what your belief system is, but I think in America that's the danger to see ourselves as, uh, as greater than, than nature. We need more and more and more and more. I was thinking, you know, this desire for more is, fits the psychological definition of a neurosis That's that cannot right. be fulfilled. And you, that, that ought to make us aware that what we are getting is not meeting our need. That's right. But what strategy do we have for, for trying to explain that and to bring people's attention to that? I mean, how do, how do we get people to see that as a mode that is, is not working? You'd think they'd notice, but the culture is too powerful in, in driving our desire, um, how do we interrupt that desire? Somewhere along the line, uh, we lost our way. In this world where we value progress and we live according to the myth of progress, we believe that there are an infinite, there are infinite opportunities for us. There's no disease that can't be defeated. Maybe we will die now, but in the long term, we can, it's reasonable to imagine we will not die, that we can we can overcome each and every one of those things. We become not only subordinated to technology, but the technology itself is what has the power to give us the immortality that we want. And, and it becomes a, an obligation that we pursue it. If we care about life, then, then we are, are bound to our, bind our fates to, to technological um, development and, and excellence. You slipped in the phrase, the myth of progress which I agree with, but that would startle many people, it, you know, in the secular world in which we currently reside, which subscribes to the view that progress is inevitable and, and linear, and, and there is a technological solution for everything. Uh, and, um, you know, it was Nietzsche who pointed out that these are not only debatable assumptions, that they're literally quite insane. As you say, Vita, it just seems so big that where do you even start? Well, you know, it, I, as an academic, I can't help it. It's like, oh, well, we have to start at least uh, by raising attention to these concerns by challenging those basic assumptions. Even the lefties point out that there's a lot to be said for technology. Uh, there's a lot to be said for the accumulation of capital as a means to accomplish things that none of us can do individually. Now we serve money and stuff rather than money and stuff serving us. What are other psychological factors? Isn't one problem that cognitively we have a hard time thinking in scale? You know, um, beyond you and your neighbor, it's really difficult to, um, to get a feel for how much excess for how much waste, how much pollution is being generated. Unfortunately, that's right. We're not built to understand that. We're animals designed by billions of years, literally, of evolution to persist in the short run. And, you know, climate change, despite how obvious it is at this point, 
It's still not immediately self-evident to any of us that currently have had the benefit of lunch. It's just inconceivable that I have to do anything uh, right now. I think that part of the problem is just the mismatch between the time frames that we're biologically equipped to ponder in the service of preserving ourselves. Uh, you know, for most of history, uh, it, it just didn't matter what coulda, shoulda, might happen uh, gazillions of light years from now. Uh, and I think that's part of it. Scientists that have no political ax to grind insist that these problems are exponentially more severe than we are led to believe. There's the daunting fact that, you know, there's too many people pissing in the pool and uh, the planet may not be uh, fit for human habitation, um, you know, in a, in a couple of millenniums. All right, well, that's, you know, a turd in our psychic punch bowl. It ties back into the inequality thing. Uh, and it's, well, all right, enough isn't enough. We got to have more than you. So on the one hand, we're not constructed to be able to think uh, in the long enough view to recognize these environmental problems. And on the other hand, we're devoted to conspicuous consumption as a means of heroic transcendence in the service of feeling good about ourselves. That's a really toxic brew. You know, I need more and more, more stuff. I'm not gonna worry about, uh, you know, climate warming 100 years from now. I see the degradation of the environment as the end product uh, of essentially this really um, uh, just uh, animated pursuit of unbridled wealth. And I wish I could claim that as an original idea, but it's not, it's actually Max Weber uh, talked about that at the end of his book about the Protestant work ethic. We want more money, we want more stuff, more money, more stuff. And in a lovely sentence, he says, I, I don't see us stopping until the last lump of coal has been burned. Now, of course, this is pre-petroleum, uh, but isn't it the same point? What are the roles of religion and ideology in our relationship to the environment? Lynn White, who happens to be a, a male historian, writes about how our contempt for nature is in part the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition, that you know we're taught that we're made in God's image, God gave us dominion over all of the creatures, and that's partly why we treat the world like a giant buffet and just systematically deplete and damage resources a lot of environmental difficulties come from a cavalier disregard of nature, uh, which is a byproduct of the kind of arrogant uh, homocentrism, uh, which is even more. It's actually when we see ourselves as created in the image of God and that, uh, you know, we're the bosses over all that crawls, flies, walks, and swims, not as, uh, uh, you know, just uh, humble creatures who coexist in a world that we share uh, with other forms of life. We're the only form of life that runs the risk of uh, being the first to be responsible for our own extinction. Why are we pissing on the environment? Oh, yeah. why are we consuming at a ridiculous and unsustainable pace? Is it more important to promote the growth of the economy or protect the planet? You know, that, that seems to be uh, a major theme underlying the environmental debate right now. It's like, you know, can we afford to protect the planet when it means that the people who own industries are gonna lose money and therefore not be able to hire people and therefore people aren't gonna be making money? Yeah, there's certainly people that, that are still denying climate change, but of those conservatives who don't, they're basically saying it's not worth messing with our economy. We might lose jobs. They're trying to resonate, find another way of getting, getting that argument that we don't have to care about the environment to resonate.
Corporations are created to make money. If the only goal is to make money, then they're going to do whatever it takes to make money. And I don't think there's an evil conspiracy behind that. What about the contempt? The response, uh, oftentimes, that you're some sort of bleeding heart liberal and you're foolish for caring about these things. If you try to do something positive about the environment, tacitly you're threatening somebody else's heroism that is based on extravagant consumption or, extra, you know, fill in the blanks. And they're defending their heroism by attacking you. You know, uh, all climate scientists are corrupt. They've been paid off, et cetera. Well, you know, you and I don't believe that, but that's a kind of reflex from people who are feeling, you know, allegiances to a lifestyle that challenges um, what we now know to be an environmental necessity. You can get people who are normally hostile to talking about these issues, to not only talk about them, but to agree that they're highly problematic but it depends how you frame the presentation. Now, of course, that's common sense masquerading as psychological discourse. But for example, if, um, if conservative, uh, you know, neoliberals, if you uh, frame environmental problems as being approachable and resolvable with market forces, they're happy to dialogue. Now, of course, that gets us back to the fact that I doubt that they are. But in a way, it doesn't matter. You know, no, it may it, not in terms, yeah. of, in terms of, well, how do we get people to even, yeah. um, you know, to start by agreeing, you know, what can we agree on? And, or at least to get them to stop attacking us. Right. What actions can we realistically take or help influence? It's about making space for everyone to have a voice. What does that look like practically? What does it look like practically to decentralize decisions? What does it look like practically for people to check power? When the Pope's encyclical uh, came out, I, I was struck by uh, how straightforward he was in his recognition of the magnitude uh, of our current environmental uh, difficulties. Um, I was also, uh, you know, literally astonished that he tied them directly uh, to economic considerations, particularly the inequality that he argues is the natural byproduct of unfettered capitalism, and then his insistence that not only the church, but all of us uh, are responsible for acknowledging that these are difficulties that we need to tackle head on, and I, I thought this was uh, promising. What I admire about the Pope is he managed to get many to say that, you know, we really ought to leave this matter to the scientists. And I thought that was just so beautiful because, you know, there's no belief in science in, uh, among so many people. But when it comes down to, you know, a religious person making an argument for the environment, uh, no, 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 it's, 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 this is a scientific matter. The more your understanding uh, lines up with reality, the better chance you're going to have to act on the reality and do something useful. Understanding something doesn't necessarily mean you can you can you can change things to make right. things better and, and control what happens in the world, but you probably have a better shot. Yeah. Historically, we, it's historically been you have a better shot of making things better if you understand what's causing the problem. What people want to do is is understand how the world works. The problem comes from identifying with the species. Yeah, that's because our symbolic immortality is tied up with the continuance of the species. Yeah. All right. And if you let go of that, then there's, there's no issue of hope. Life, life will continue such as it is for whatever organisms are viable over time. We need to begin with finitude. We need to begin with a much more explicit awareness of finitude. Um, it's not, uh, it's the myth of progress, not because progress isn't possible and we haven't made it, sure. but because that belief in progress sees it as unending. It is also not inconsistent with Christianity to see yourself not as the Lord of the world, but rather the steward of all of God's creatures and 
what some folks have pointed out is that right now at the vanguard of the environmental movement are the Greens, well, we expect that, and some fundamentalists and the indigenous peoples. Faber says, I don't think we're gonna stop till the last chunk of coal has been burned. That's and grim. It is grim. Uh, you know, hope he's wrong, but um, he, he saw, I think, this kind of demonic um, the, the process. And uh, what I keep hearing you say, and I, I agree with wholeheartedly, is we've got to, the only way to throw a wrench in that it is to get a critical mass of people to be sufficiently self-reflective to understand what's happening and to understand that none of us are immune from being affected by that. What's the figure it takes to, to have a successful revolution? People have different figures, you know, 7% of the right. population who's active and, um, that if you have a relatively small group of people that can, you know, that through influence, I think right. it can make a really big difference. Yeah. Well, you also seem to be saying we kind of need to re-enchant the world around us. That, um, you know, one of the unfortunate byproducts of the industrial and scientific revolution is that we've sucked all the mystery and uh, out of life, uh, leaving us devoid of meaning, except for shopping and narcissism. And those, I think, are, are huge ideas, Henry, but I also, uh, you also said that if we understood ourselves, we also have to accept, res there's, we have an ethical responsibility mm -hmm. as humans. I was careful not to use more responsibility yeah, or I obligation because I think that I use the term a call to action yeah. because I think it's more about listening. Okay. It, it's more about listening. We are in a unique moment of history when we have not only threats, but we have opportunities, opportunities and capacities. We've worked hard to get here. What will we do with it? Yeah. All right, let's see. But it's usually a small yeah. group of people who are able to change the entire system because they really believe in it yeah. and they put energy in it and they are very aware of the, th the thinking and motivation of the people around them. Yeah. And they're able to exercise this huge influence. And um, I, I think there are a lot of what I would call good people. Yeah. You know, meaning that their motivations are, are um, pro-humanity. Yeah, no, I like that. Where is their hope? I'm big on hope. I, I think it does require a leap of faith. And why not? But I think the, what we were pretty sure of is that it's not determined. That's right. And even as we can stack the cards for a dismal outcome for humanity, the the most important card is the, ne the one we deal next. Yeah, let's not toss in the cards. Exactly. <laughs> let's, let's keep playing. You know, let the house close it down. <laughs> let's keep playing. <laughs> awesome. Becker says in the Escape from Evil book that he fervently hopes that the sway of reason uh, can balance destruction. And I want to remember what Kirby said. His thought was, well, look, on one level, those of us that traffic in ideas, you know, we should be doing this kind of discourse. We have to bat these ideas around. But that doesn't mean that we all need to be going on Oprah, trying to turn plumbers into metaphysicians. There's another level where we just need people on the ground. At every level of society and activity, there's things that we ought to be able to do. But I gotta think about that more. I don't think people could stand up without something to believe in. And moreover, I think they need something to believe in that could never be unambiguously confirmed or disconfirmed. So that means you can't end faith. Uh, you know, even the Harrises and Dennett's and Dawkins of the world have faith in the power of science and reason. 
And so this is back to the Beckerian question of, well, then what are the best illusions? We have two choices. We can either follow illusions that were gestated and maintained unconsciously for thousands of years that have served us well to a certain extent, but then we've run afoul. Or we can say to ourselves in the 21st century, let's step back and let's take stock of what we now know and what can we conjure up uh, based on that knowledge. And so I like E.O. Wilson, for example, when he says, well, I don't see what's wrong uh, with believing in an idea. He calls it biophilia, love of life. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with loving life? Why don't we give that a try? Thank you.